Thank you everyone for, for joining us. I noticed on the attendee list, there's a, a lot of new faces this week. So, uh, so welcome. This is uh, when the pandemic started, this was something that Leger thought was an important tool or tactic or whatever you want to call it to put out there and talk to people and share information. We, we wanted to give back in some way and we thought, you know, we're information gatherers. So let's gather information we, individually with people like Christine, who's joining us today. Um, but also uh, we have a weekly uh, COVID-19 survey that we've been releasing. Uh, we have about 10 waves of data out right now. If you do not receive that, it's free to receive. It's, uh, you can go to uh, leger360.com and sign up to receive uh, that. And it uh, basically looks at how Canadians and Americans are coping with COVID-19. And, and then we add in extra questions. This week's extra questions were around conspiracy theories. And um, it's surprising how much uh, fake news and uh, these types of uh, discussions have permeated into both Canadian and even more so American culture, where we have a, a belief or there's a sense that maybe these conspiracy theories are true. The one good thing we're finding is that uh, Canadians uh, and Americans are both becoming less fearful of, uh, of catching COVID-19 and less fearful that someone in their family will catch it. And then generally, people are happy with the rollout that we have in terms of the back to the workplace, back to uh, social interaction. So even though we hear a lot about protests, and we hear about people demanding, let's open up the economy right now, generally citizens of both Canada and the US are taking a much more measured approach. And that's in our weekly study that we're putting out there. Uh, we're also delivering a few syndicated studies, one looking specifically at our purchasing habits, retail, uh, consumer packaged goods, what is the future hold for that? And another one on the future of healthcare in Canada as we come out of this. That's all information is available on our website. So all of that, let me uh, start with a quick introduction today of, uh, of Christine who's joined us. Uh, Christine is the Chief Communications Officer at Sheridan College. Prior to joining Sheridan, she ran her own communication consultancy for 10 years, uh, helping numerous colleges, universities, hospitals, and social service agencies in Canada to communicate their impact. And she began her career as a fundraiser, uh, but moved more into this world. Uh, and I'm glad she did because it gave us an opportunity to meet uh, when she did her Master's of Communication Management program at McMaster University. She's the president of the Hamilton chapter of the Canadian Public Relations Society. So I guess this is a, a meeting of the Toronto uh, Golden Horseshoe Triangle of CPRS presidents, because I'm in Toronto still. So at least for another month before our AGM. Uh, she's vice president of the Alice and Murray Maitland Charitable Foundation, and her work has been recognized with over 30 regional, national, and international awards. So welcome, Christine, to this. And uh, from all of the attendees, which I will say, um, some are, are regular attendees who join this every week, but there is a larger than normal proportion of post-secondary uh, institution communicators on today and and, and I, I think what we were here to, to learn about is this is something that you would have never had to go through or in the past but obviously uh, things had to change very quickly for colleges and universities um, and you've had to make uh, you had to communicate with a diverse audience but, but let's go back to everything did you have, you know, so this is a yes or no answer, but I'm going to ask you to expand on it. Did you have pandemic in your preparedness plan? So we did uh, because of SARS and because of H1N1. So a lot of Ontario colleges and universities did have that. We also have a standard incident management system plan. A lot of our executive and our leaders have been trained in emergency management response, sort of the FEMA model and what that looks like and how to scale up and scale down. Uh, an, an emergency operations center, depending on the nature of the crisis that you're hit with, whether it's a flood or um, any other natural disaster, it doesn't have to be a, a global health pandemic. 
So we have the overarching plan, which does include um, pandemic response. We also had different situational experience. So we had in 2017, an academic strike that shut down um, teaching and learning for five weeks uh, at our college and across all colleges in Ontario. So we had a very robust plan and framework in place with how to deal with you know, a similar element of what we're feeling now where students are not on campus and how do we respond to that. We also had several years before then a situation with a building delay. So we had 1400 students who were expecting to move into a really beautiful mm -hmm. building in Mississauga. We had told them to get rid of their apartment leases in Brampton where they were already, where their programs were located at a different campus. And then six weeks before opening found we couldn't move everybody. So we needed an immediate crisis response and moving people, moving programs, different type of delivery, all that went with that. So we are pulling on bits and pieces of those plans to refresh and to create our pandemic response. So in a, in a sense, yes, we were prepared, but of course there's no playbook for this crisis, right? And as I think we're all feeling that we're facing a global health pandemic and a worldwide economic crisis, the likes of which none of us in our generation has certainly ever seen. So um, in a way we've had to be very nimble and responsive. Um, I'd say we've also turned very heavily to our strategic plan um, as a, as, which gave us a bit of a level of preparedness that was launched a year ago. And it really presciently sort of described that we're, it's the world that we're living in right now. And it really talked about a, a need for preparing learners and employees to respond and to thrive in an, in an era where change is the only, is the only constant. And, and uh, we really question very collectively across our institution, what do we need to do to prepare our students and our employees to thrive in a world like that? So again, it's not a crystal ball, but it just afforded us some sort of uh, advantage because we've had those conversations. And then to really frame our response, of course, we created guiding principles for decision-making for this pandemic. And that includes things like uh, the prominence of the physical health and well-being of our learning community, that regardless of the delivery mechanism, whether it's remote, online, hybrid, whatever it is, that the academic quality will be paramount and that people will get the learning outcomes uh, that they're promised and that the uh, programs will live up to our academic plan promises and those pillars of quality character and accountability and that really we're going to navigate this together as a community as a learning community um, in a way that really demonstrates compassion and kindness and generosity um, but we also have a fiduciary duty to um, preserve Sheridan's assets and sustainability into the long run so it's a whole bunch of things we're trying to balance um, and then uh, I'd say the other thing is establishing guiding, guiding principles for communications as well was really important so that we can um, really share, uh, communicate very quickly, decisively and consistently, whether that's happening centrally at the, at the communications um, hub or helping our leaders across the institution to amplify our messages with their audiences uh, where they hold those relationships and where it makes more sense for them to do so. Okay. So you talk about across, so you have the hub versus the, can you describe your communications um, system a little bit for the, for people who are listening? Yeah, absolutely. So there's really, um, so we have uh, our PVP group, which is our presidents and vice presidents, Vice President's um, Committee, which I'm very thankful to have a seat on. And of course, having a seat at the table is a very coveted position. And it's also uh, been very helpful in terms of framing the institution's response and working very closely with our leaders to get consistent and uh, timely information and decisions made uh, and communicated out to the community. Uh, so there's that team, which is really like a policy-making, decision-making body. And then there are three other main tables. So we have our provost table and our decanal group. Uh, who are really looking at academic integrity and how the programs need to change and to shift in order to be delivered in remote format um, and how you maintain the quality and the learning outcomes in everything that we're teaching. Then we have our Emergency Operations Centre, which is really the planning table that directs and coordinates our response to the pandemic with representatives from all the functional and operational areas, so IT and student services and um, you know, facilities and health and safety and security. Um, the important thing is uh, communications has a seat at all of the tables, um, less so now uh, at the provost table, but certainly within the first four weeks of the, or six weeks of the academic 
of the of the switch and the pivot to remote i was attending those meetings so that there's cross information happening um, and then we have what we've called a galvanized education hub and galvanize is a word that is drawn from our strategic plan so our strategic plan is about galvanizing education for a complex world so this is uh, really a think tank task force of leaders like our dean of innovation and our director of creativity um, some academic colleagues uh, who are really tasked with coming up with enrollment innovation. So what could we be doing? What are we not doing right now to meet the needs of a post sort of pandemic world? And what can we be doing to shore up enrollment um, right across the institution? So there's these interconnected planning tables with um, you know, re cross representation and sort of our presidents and our vice presidents table sitting at the middle as the policy decision making body. So extremely, okay. Compared to some of the people that I've been talking to since this has started, not necessarily on the webinars, but just in general, that is at the far end of extremely organized and, and prepared in the pandemic in place. So that's fantastic. Um, day one hits. Yes. And how well, I mean, how well has the pandemic followed your plan, I guess, is the, is the way of putting it. Yes. Um, how, how well has the plan worked so far? And, and, and what has worked and where, where are areas that you hadn't considered that you've had to come right. up with things on the fly? So if I go back to day one, of course, the mindset was very different back then than it is now. And I sort of, I guess I would take you back to March 11th when the World Health Organization declared this to be a global pandemic. Um, we had started communicating about COVID-19 and coronavirus uh, as of early January. So when I finally mapped out our communications response plan. It's really a, a plan that's a year and a half in length that started January 1 until April 17th is the first phase called recovery. And that was the immediate crisis response. Get, it, get Let's get us through the winter term and get things done and communicate what we're doing to help learners finish what they had started right back mm -hmm. in September. And then really looking at um, April 18th until uh, September 14th, which is the start of our fall semester, this middle phase of recalibration and what do we need to do, um, not only to deliver our spring summer term, which is on right now with 8,400 learners at Sheridan remotely, um, but what are we doing to uh, pivot and to recalibrate everything that we're offering um, in order to make it viable in this sort of new era that we're living in. And then once we hit the fall, the plan really looks at long-term recovery and, and really goes until April 30th of next year. So again, so much has changed. So the, the starting point for us, even though we were communicating already in January about travel restrictions or, you know, nobody's going to conferences anymore and these things as, you know, global health directives were starting to change, the pivot point really for us was March, about March 12th. And uh, I don't know if you recall, but within a span of maybe 24 hours, almost every academic institution across Canada, it was like a big domino wave that right. went right across the country where everybody announced within um, really 24 hours that they would be taking the following week, which just happened to coincide with March break in, in Ontario um, as a hiatus so that faculty could be afforded the time they needed to retool their, their offerings in order to make sure that our students would be able to complete their terms. So back then, it was really about um, just understanding, you know, people were in such a state of shock. There was fear, there was anxiety. People were so worried about their personal health and safety, the unknown, and really worried about whether their term would be lost. Like I put in all this work and, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm right there, the, the end of term is in the middle of April and I hope I'm not gonna lose my term. So, so much of the communication at the beginning really had to be about reassuring that we would move mountains to make sure that you would be able to complete you invest so much so back then the focus on the messaging really was about integrity and getting the learning outcomes that you were promised maybe reminding people that while things might look and feel different or be a little bit bumpy um, we know that our professors are the best in the business and that they're absolutely committed committed professionals and um, in many instances represent the fields of study that these students are going into, right? They're industry experts. They have one foot in industry, especially at a college. Um, they want to make sure that people are well prepared and, and we know that they will live up to that. So it was really about focusing on people's immediate needs um, and really promising, you know, at that time, anything that had been pre-scheduled for that March break, we've just told you you can't be here. 
Um, but there was assignments that had been pre-scheduled for those days, so reassuring people that there wouldn't be academic penalty if they didn't hit something in, and then kind of catching the little hiccups. So, um, you know, professors might have put in learning or reminders in their learning management system, like auto reminders that were going out to say, don't forget you've got this due next week, and meanwhile we've just told you centrally that so, there are no yeah. assignments next week. So. Um, a lot of use of social media monitoring and students would call us out on that and then we can back channel and kind of get those issues resolved. Um, so a lot of work just to make people feel calm at that point. Uh, a big learning at that point though was that we realized that not everybody has a computer and not everybody had Wi-Fi. Uh, and that was a real shocker I'd say because you'd, you'd expect that most students um, have both and, and quickly learning that in a world where We've just shut down libraries, we've just shut down all the Starbucks, we've just shut down uh, the common areas, the college is forced to be closed under public health directives. Students didn't have the materials, to, and we've just told you you have to do everything remotely, um, and now you're stuck. So uh, in very short order, our amazing colleagues in IT uh, Jerry rigged this loaner laptop program where we've had um, hundreds and hundreds of students uh, borrowing laptops. So we FedExed them to their houses, um, we figured out uh, Wi-Fi access and helped them figure out Wi-Fi access uh, so that they could get their learning done. So a lot of that's sort of, I guess, to your point, you can't always be prepared for everything. We weren't yeah. prepared for that one. Well, and, and, and and just, and, at a sorry, time just, when every company in Canada, too, was looking for laptops, so they weren't easy to source. But it was 3,000 pieces, basically, that got retooled over that week. So it was a lot of work. Well, and on just on that point alone, you're looking at a whole new set of cohort coming in in the fall, mm -hmm. um, and you know some, and again, some of that's going to be um, virtual. Um, are you? Does that then limit the new student to only those who have Wi-Fi, or have you extended that program to new and incoming students? How are you managing that whole Absolutely. next? And I, I know we're, I know I'm focusing just on this topic, but I think that's a really interesting pivot. Um, because you're right, not everyone has that. And how do you, how do you keep people, you know, integrity is important to get through this term, but it's also important, you talked about your fiduciary responsibility, to make sure new students can show up and, and come in and have the tools there for them as well. For sure. So it has extended to the spring program, which is where our heads are at right now. As I said, um, May 19th, we had 8,400 students start. Um, in our different programs, which is typically our smallest term, our spring-summer term, so that uh, program was available as well. There was less uptake on it for spring-summer, um, so we absolutely are looking at all these types of things for the fall as well. We're also looking at, um, with our, the, all the programs, there are typically, typically program kits that come, um, so for students who have to do arts-based programs, for example, uh, their program kit, kit these include things like supplies. So we're looking at now for animation, sending home tablets and Cintiqs and Wacoms and really sort of, um, it's a different kind of learning. It's not really trying to help people understand that it's not, um, it's not the equivalent of watching a three hour video lecture or a recorded PowerPoint, but you know, imagine a, a scenario where we send these things home or um, you know, you're actually not paying the same program kit fees you would normally because you're just borrowing equipment, but then you're gonna use that money and here's a shopping list of what you would normally would have spent on those fees to be able to buy a camera and do all your assignments at home, for example, if you're studying yeah. photography and then students keep that equipment at the end. Okay, that's good. So, um, so for yeah. the audience, for the audience, mm -hmm. there is a questions tab. If anyone would like to write in with questions, uh, I'm gonna keep on going with here. So I. I, I but I'm happy to ask questions that the audience has. Um, Christine, I, I stopped you a little bit there. You were talking about um, sort of the, the, the four waves of, of your plan and how it's going and how you did have to pivot on, you know, does, do people have Wi-Fi? Um, is there anything that you've done that you're particularly proud of, that you're thinking has worked very well, either that was in your plan or has not been in your plan? What are some of the, the, the tactics that are, that are really positively working out for you? So in terms of responding to uh, communicating or in terms of um, sort of the, how we're retooling what we're offering. As well, let's, let's, talk, let's talk communicating in terms of, because you've yeah. got such a diverse group of audiences. We do. So we, yeah. you know, like every institution, right? We have childcare on campus. We have an elder care research center. 
we have a residence. So we have people who live on campus. We have um, learners across all ages, whether they're direct from high school or come to us later in life. Uh, it's, it's very complex. Um, so it's absolutely really, again, trying to understand their mindset, as I'd say, um, and international and domestic students, um, those things are all important. So we're looking at what, what's, what's working well, I guess, really going back to basics. So identifying the needs of our audience, what their gaps are, what their mindset is, what their fears are. And we're doing that through multiple channels. So we've done right at the outset, we did primary research with our student body and trying to figure out how this pandemic is affecting them. Um, including, did they have Wi-Fi? Do they have a laptop? You know, yeah. um, just basic things. How are they doing financially? Uh, one of the outcomes of that was that about a month before the federal government very generously announced its um, uh, relief bursary for academic students, we cobbled together our own uh, worth well over a million dollars uh, that was available for students facing whatever kind of hardships. So if, if for you it was food, you could use it to buy food. If for you it was you needed a Wi-Fi stick, you could use it to buy the Wi-Fi stick. Um, really, and a lot of that also came out in, in asking about students whether or not their own prospects for employment um, really went out the window with the, the pandemic, because so, so many of our students, of course, work retail um, right. while they're studying. So that was a quick response to that, and that was really identified through primary research. Uh, we do a ton of secondary research. The Leger, I read these, these polls religiously as they come out. They're fantastic. I'm glad um, to hear that. I've got the Health Canada app so I can see on a daily basis how the numbers are tracking. I'm looking at job layoffs. I'm looking at the mindset of our employees. I think the further we go, everybody knows someone who is either sick or um, who has lost a job. Uh, that's really framing our response. One of our guiding principles, and I didn't get into sharing exactly what they were for communications, is really two-way communication, but it's also to lead with empathy. Um, because in a situation that's as fluid as this, uh, People want details, people want answers, and you don't always have them. Uh, but what you can exhibit is empathy and understanding. Um, we're doing a ton of uh, social listening, as I mentioned, you know, catching those hiccups with the professors whose auto reminders hadn't gone off. Um, so to be able to escalate and see, you know, people, if, if, if someone's on there who's, who's complaining or worse, who seems to be struggling, or we see posts about people who are crying, we escalate those to our student affairs and counseling team right away, who can then intervene with a phone call. Um, we have two hotlines that we set up right at the start of the crisis, so an email hotline and a phone hotline that are monitored. We also had our counseling staff proactively phone out to thousands of students, starting with our international students at the start of this, just to do check-in calls and see how people are doing. Uh, all of our managers have been encouraged to do check-in calls with their employees and are being given resources on those conversations and how to have them. Uh, we did an all-employee town hall in terms of, as you can imagine, people wondering about our financial position, like other colleges you see, um, you know, news of if enrollment uh, takes a dive, what does that mean for us as an institution and how do we answer that? So really trying to have those open conversations. And of course, so much of this, right, in any crisis is about leadership and positioning your leadership. So we're really playing up to our strengths. We are incredibly fortunate to have a bold, um, aspiring, charismatic, super intelligent leader who, um, who is great with, with leading and with people. Uh, so we put her out front and center whenever we can, whether that's through recorded video snippets to our students, um, she does, at the start of this, we did daily updates from her uh, through an email, some of them written, some of them as video clips. Uh, that sort of scaled down to three times a week and then now twice a week for employees, once a week for students. But I think it's up to, I think we've done 67 or 72, something like that, emails since March 12th. Uh, really, again, right, trying to find that balance where people are really hungry for details. And I think part of that's because, um, there's so much unknown and so much instability that people are, are looking for a sense of security and they just want answers. And of course, our challenge as communicators is finding those answers, finding something relevant to communicate, not over communicating, uh, giving something of value, not drowning people in information, but you know, feeding that appetite for knowledge. And the rub comes when you can't find the answers fast enough because we're still in the, in the process of making those decisions and trying to nail down something concrete to share. 
and trying to sort of bridge that space. Um, the other thing that we've done with our leader, which has been really um, welcomed and really received, and we've just started this in the last couple of weeks, is to offer 15-minute um, coffee chats. Uh, so anybody, any employee can sign up uh, for a virtual coffee chat, of course, from your own coffee uh, with our president one-to-one, -one, just to ask about what's going on or just talk about how the pandemic is affecting them and their role. We're launching an all-employee survey this week, and that got delayed a little bit because we had a different employee survey in market, uh, so we didn't want to trip the two up on each other. So this one's going out a little bit later than we would have liked normally in the cycle. Um, and then our, our president is also doing virtual dinners with students. So we do have a number of students who are in residence, and she's she comes from uh, she spent her whole academic career as a uh, understanding students and the student mindset and supporting students and learning uh, about how people learn so this is her sweet spot um, she's always happiest talking to students so um, our on-campus food provider is sponsoring these and um, is currying out the dinners to people if they're off campus or if they're in residence they come down one at a time socially distanced and pick up their food go back to their room um, it gets sent to her house and then they all log in to a Zoom call and, and sort of break bread together and, and talk about this pandemic response and those have been really insightful as well. That's, right. that's fantastic to have a leader that's willing to do all of those rules and, and, the, and you're at the table you said as well in Absolutely. terms of discussion so that's, that's important as well. For um, sure I don't know how you would do this if you weren't so I, I, um, I feel for anybody out there who's not because uh, I, I really, it, it, it makes all the difference in the world. So one of the questions, talk, and you, have, you talked a little bit about listening, to, uh, how you're listening to what students are saying and you're doing your surveys. Um, that's, that's gathering what's going on. But how do you know that your messages are being received as well? Are you using the same tools for feedback or what are you, what are you doing to make sure that people are getting the message and understanding what you're trying to say? So a lot of it, I guess, is through the social listening and seeing is there confusion? What What's the two-way feedback loop? Are the complaints going down? What are people telling us on social, on email? Um, are they doing what we ask them to do? So part of, part of right now, what we're trying to really focus on is retooling, of course, for the, um, for the fall and convincing people that the sort of what we call emergency remote teaching in winter is not the same experience that they're going to get in the fall. So um, oh, really show people about how it's going to be different and um, how the how when you have more than a week <laughs> to kind of retool a curriculum, what we can deliver will be a whole lot better. So I guess if we do a good job with that, we should see enrollment uh, continue to rise. Um, so uh, looking at data in other ways and what's the story the data is telling us. So um, I can tell you for the fall term, you know, there's certain key dates coming up. So we're trying to, to do very strategic communication in advance of those dates for recruitment uh, purposes and for conversion to uh, accept offers and to um, uh, before a deposit deadline, for example. Um, so our accepts are at generally at a really good spot compared to last year. Uh, you know, we're project we were projecting for a lot uh, bigger dip in enrollment than what we're seeing in terms of our accepts. What we're not seeing or what we're seeing differently this year versus other years is fewer people having paid their deposits this early in the cycle. So that suggests to us that people are waiting. They're waiting for more information to understand what this experience is going to be like to see if it's worth it, if it's worth doing, if it's worth taking a different offer, your offer, is it worth doing a gap year? What's my best plan? And I think people are waiting and being cautious to find out if we can convince them. So in terms of what's different, we, you know, in the summer, we would often spend time trying to work with stu students who don't know us and don't know the shared and experience to convert them to accept our offers and to pay their fees to enroll. We're spending a lot more time this year, which we've never really done before um, in this comprehensive of a, of a way to almost re-recruit our returning students, right? I think they need just as much convincing that it's better to come back and, or, instead of take that year off, you know, maybe not go somewhere else. I've already got so much invested in this institution and in this degree, but I need to convincing that it's gonna be worth my time if I'm gonna put the money down, if I'm gonna come back. So we're spending a lot of time showing 
uh, about academic integrity, about how we're switching labs to be robust, about how online or, or remote learning can still be engaging. There can be accompanying chat and text and group work. Um, all these things won't go away. It's not going to be a recorded PowerPoint. Um, what are we doing to encourage engagement and socialization? Because, of course, that's a big part of your academic experience and your post-secondary experience, not just the credential, which is really first and foremost, of course, but that whole socialization and learning community. So we're spending a lot of time promoting now things that we've taken virtually. We have virtual yoga classes, virtual cooking classes. We have our athletic trainers fi filming videos of workouts that people can do at home and really trying to get that sense of community. The, the pub night, Friday night, open mic sessions are now virtual. So really just sure. remind people those things aren't going away. Um, and again, that was part of that sort of messaging to your point, Dave, switching our narrative partway through about this isn't what's closed because you know we had to close but now what's open and what's yeah. open differently and virtually and of course we know that um safety right safety is top of mind whether you know you're seeing it on what leger is putting out in your studies in terms of people's um willingness and comfort to leave the house. You know, we've got just as many probably um, employees who are anxious to get back as those who are anxious to leave home um, and to go out in public. So trying to balance all of that and, and the only way you can do it is really to show, not just tell what we'll be doing to protect people and keep their safety if and when they are allowed to come to campus. So we have announced already that our fall term will be largely remote. So anything that can be delivered remotely will be. We're trying to now demonstrate and show and tell what that looks like and feels like. So part of what we're doing to re-recruit and to kind of convince students to come back and to sign our offers is to uh, do dedicated days in June, one per faculty, where it, we already have virtual houses, virtual open houses, virtual guided tours, but these are really specific to the faculties of study um, where program coordinators can be there to talk about what the learning might be like for their program, right? Because as you can imagine, you've got 128 programs. These are all going to be done differently. Uh, at a meta level, you can only give so much detail, right? The, yeah. the, the further you can go down to that target audience for that program, the better it gets. And we, we threw these together uh, very uh, quickly, relatively speaking. Uh, we promoted them, and within 12 hours, I think we had 500 people sign up. So there's appetite for that kind of stuff. So again, you know, it's looking at our, what's the uptake, right? What is the data telling us in different ways? So, so I love this. I asked one question, and I think you answered four of the audience's questions in that. So right. this is perfect. But, but and, I, and I'm going to paraphrase this question a little bit, because I, I'm listening to everything you're doing, and it is, uh, it, there's so much there. And I, I guess I'm a little overwhelmed listening to all the different ways that you're communicating. How are you handling that to maintain consistency of messaging? Because you talked about having your central, yeah. your central team, and then you've got other people. So all of this is going on. How do you manage that it's all on what you need to have said and consistency across everybody? How are you doing that? Yeah. So uh being relatively smaller so i worked in university settings i worked in college settings relatively speaking we're pretty lean and mean uh, which is a blessing and a disguise <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the blessing part is that it's easier to manage the message uh, so a lot of our areas are really looking at what our president puts out in her messaging and really taking that tone and that lead from there so that's i'd say one way um, another way is that uh, all of the leaders at the table who are who have seats at each other's tables, right? That ensures a lot of consistency. Uh, having the framework for decision making and the guiding principles for communications, uh, and those guiding principles for communications were sent to every leader across the institution and to every manager across the institution. We've asked people to stick to them. So as long as you're sticking to those types of principles, uh, that helps to ensure consistency too. Um, I've finally gotten to the point where I actually wrote out, like articulated the plan that we're now socializing and sharing. And that this was one of those, um, I guess, painful moments, right? For a communicator, for all of us where, and I've, you know, I've talked to colleagues who are running communications operations at hospitals, at municipalities, at private companies. And we are all sort of in the same boat where, 
this hit so quickly, it was so complicated, it was so fluid that it took us out of our um, comfort zone, which would be normally, you don't do anything this big without a plan and without writing it all out, but there was no time. Uh, because we were all in such a rush just to really go day to day to day. Um, so as painful as it was, I actually found the time, I don't know where and how, to write this plan um, because the days are really long. Um, but having it written down and shared now I think is really helpful. So I would say that if, if you haven't done it and as hard as it is to do, just make the time to do it because Number one, I've actually been able to sleep better because it's not all on my head at night, but um, it just sort of allows that sort of sense of confidence and consistency. Talking with someone a few weeks back, they, they said that one of the things that's nice to have is someone who's chronicling this right. throughout the future pandemic right. plans. Is that, I mean, you said you wrote it down, but that's the plan now. Are you, is that part of the chronicling process to go forward 100%, as well? 100%. Yeah. So the, the plan is really a three, my plan is a three in one. It's, it is a communication strategy and roadmap. It is a toolkit. So certain sections of it can be cut and paste and pulled out like our communications goals, our approved key messages and a tactical chart of, you know, chronological order of, of all the communications that we're doing right through paid, earned, owned social media, experiential design, whether it's like the signage that we're creating for our spaces on campus, um, the whole gambit. Um, and then part of it is chronicling. So because yeah. we're logging every communication that goes out in chronological order, we've got a great archive as we okay. go. So we're getting, and I don't like to go have these run too long because everyone's time is valuable right now. So I, but I have, I'm going to take two more questions of the ones that are left for you. Um, but before we do that, I just want to remind everyone, we have two more of these sessions coming up on the following Thursdays. Next week is Meredith Maxwell, uh, who's in public health. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, similar to this, all of a sudden you have to start communicating in uh, extreme way to everyone uh, and it depends on your communications and people's reactions to it um, depends on how sick people get and how do you manage that and how do you manage uh, the information the listening tactics that are going on and how do you turn that into um, uh, communications that people will listen to and do uh, and how do we continue that when it goes on for months and months and months and there was an interesting Andre Picard article in the Globe and Mail that said you can't tell people to stop doing something. It's how do you mitigate that behavior and get them to change things. So we're going to talk about, Meredith and I are going to talk about that next week. And the week after that is Dr. Noni McDonald, who is an expert in, from Dalhousie University, an expert in vaccine hesitancy and vaccine communication. So we're going to talk about what happens when a vaccine is available and how does Canada and the world communicate this and um, maximize the number of people who are willing to take it or um, accept that it's there for them. So, so thank you for joining. And then this will also be recorded if anyone missed anything or you want to share this with other people as well. So the last two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First off is, um, of everything that happened, is there anything, so we had a whole bunch of questions show up and I lost it for a second here. Is there anything that you would have done differently so far? Is there anything, and you can say no, that's okay. Is yeah. there anything that you've done that you go, ooh, I wish we would have done that a little bit differently, taken a little different approach? Because this is so much hitting the ground running on some of this. For sure. Um, if I could have written that plan earlier, I would have. That would be a quick one. I would have surveyed employees sooner if we could have. Yep. Um, again, we had a, a different survey and market that we couldn't. Um, I still toy with whether or not we would have returned to advertising sooner than we did. So right at March 12th, again, to um, underscore and, and understand people and respect the, with empathy, right, the magnitude of the situation we pulled, um, you know, you couldn't pull down billboards, but we stopped um, advertising our programs, right, because it was really about people's health, people's well-being, people's response. So we waited um, a good month before we did any kind of program marketing. I think there was others who went out a little earlier. I'm still kind of noodling whether or not that was the right decision, if we should have went back a little early, earlier or not. Um, but those would, I guess, probably be the main things. Um, yeah. 
and maybe so we, we've also spent a lot of time capturing good news stories um, because they're memorable and they inspire hope and optimism um, so you know shaking down more trees to getting out more of those stories and and in the absence of advertising about our programs, really we've switched talking about our brand and about our reputation through the good work that we're doing in the community, whether it was the million dollar scholarship, whether it was donating you know, unused PPE because of our shuttered healthcare centers to local hospitals. Our 3D printing lab is now printing face shields that we're donating to hospitals and long-term care centers. Uh, just yesterday, we did a video live stream of that to local high schools to kind of fill in math and science and um, curriculum and engineering type courses for, for professors. So that was really a great partnership. Um, it's somehow just making the time to keep doing that. We, the other thing you sort of touched on this and your, your next speaker will talk about it in terms of sustainability for the long term. We tried in the very first few weeks of the, the crisis to do a leader rotation. Uh, which is again a best practice in emergency operations center where you can tap in and tap off. So out of the sort of my, my role, uh, a director of communications role and a manager of communications role, we put in a fourth uh, marketing director and then the four of us rotated through those three leader communication roles and then every fourth day you would have a day off, which wasn't a day off work, but it was a day to do non <laughs> So that yeah. so much stuff wouldn't be piling up and then it was really about, you know, distancing yourself, just unplugging and not thinking about this topic for a day when it's, you're living and breathing it all the time. Um, but also about really, um, you know, learning about each other's roles because, you know, with this pandemic, the other thing that we didn't really expect, and thankfully this hasn't happened yet on our team, but any one of us could go down with the illness. So what are we doing to create that redundancy to make sure that we can keep this communications enterprise going if we ever get in that unfortunate situation. Good, it's fantastic. Um, so the last question, are you willing to share a personal favorite moment during this experience? Personal favorite moment? Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I thought that was a great way to end. If, if you have, because you just listed off a whole bunch of things yeah. that shared and is doing this really good. Is there something that really stands out for you? Okay, it's a really little one, but I love it. So um, our team of communications professionals uh, we use Slack to keep in touch with each other all the time. And thankfully, we were already well established on it before we went remote. Um, but so much about this, right, when we're in a time of uncertainty, and I think that the reason why we can still work as well as we do together is because we really like each other. Um, and we were a tight knit team beforehand. So there was a group of um, employees on that in, in our team who used to do a daily walk to Tim Hortons, uh, you know, 10 o'clock. To go get a coffee and then come back and um, really have that personal time and the 10 o'clock coffee channel is now a thing on slack so really encouraging people um, to find ways to keep connected uh, we yeah. you know especially now when we're so distributed you have to make time um, for for those opportunities to stay tight as a team so I, I love the fact that somebody just said, hey, this doesn't have to end. We've got different ways to do this now. And I know we work better together as a team because of the tight connection we have with each other. So I'm so when I saw that, I was just so thrilled uh, to see that the coffee, the coffee walk is now a virtual thing. <laughs> That's fantastic. Christine, thank you very much for this. Um, I don't think you can see it, but we are getting lots of thanks from the people that were in the audience as well. So. I'm glad you joined. I'm glad you shared with us, and uh, I, I hope that uh, we've missed the virtual coffee chat today, walk today. But okay. I hope you'll enjoy tomorrow's 10 o'clock uh, virtual walk for coffee. But thank you. Thank you again very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.